welcome. Please take your seats. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and friends of Afghanistan. I am Liv Kjølseth, and I'm the Secretary General of the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee. And I have the honor of introducing you to the ninth of in total 13 events of Afghanistan Week 2022. Afghanistan Week is the sixth of its kind, and it brings together politicians, journalists, academics, activists, and activists from Afghanistan, Norway, and beyond to address key issues and to stimulate debate and understanding about Afghanistan. The first week took place in 2014, and it's now a biannual event. The Afghanistan Week is hosted in a cultural collaboration of four organizations, the Christian Mikkelsen Institute, Peace Research Institute Oslo, the Nansen Center for Peace and Dialogue, and the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee. And the week is made possible through financial support from NORAD, Fritt Ord, and the Norwegian Center for uh -huh. Humanitarian Studies. Yesterday, it was exactly 15 months since Taliban surprised and shocked all Afghans and the entire world by taking control over Afghanistan. The armed conflict has now mostly ended, but peace is more than the absence of war. The situation do differ among the provinces and districts, where some finally have the chance to leave their home without the fear of concerns of drones and bombs. Others have lost everything, their job, their lifestyle, as well as their hope for the future. So the painful truth is that the human, human security for Afghans have, this, uh, have decreased. There is no economic security. People don't have the jobs and nor the means to provide for themselves and their families. And there is no food security. Most people do not have sufficient access to food and many are facing hunger, worrying how they will survive this coming winter. There is no health security. Malnutrition and diseases are taking more lives as the access to health services is less. Child and maternal mortality is on the rise. And there is no environmental security. Afghanistan is the country in Asia most impacted by climate change and that has the least of resources to adapt to the changes. The soil erosion, drought and flash floods continue to be the underlying threat to life in Afghanistan. And there is no political security. Fundamental rights, like the rights to education and the freedom of speech are not respected. And human rights abuses are well documented. Liberal institutions are undermined. And there is no personal security. Survivors of violence and abuse have now want to turn to. Child labor is increasing and violence and terror attacks are again re-emerging. Re Women, girls, religious and ethnic minorities are the most vulnerable to all these the multiple dimensions of human security. The mental impact of school closure and the restrictions on women participation must not be underestimated. And there is a strong sense of collective depression and a fear for what the future will bring. But the lack of human security is nothing new for the Afghan people. And we need to remind ourselves that Afghanistan was rated as the sixth most fragile state in the world by the OECD in 2018. And in 2022, it's the third most vulnerable state. In other words, it has gone from bad to worse. The billion dollar investments in aid to Afghanistan by the international community after the military intervention in 2001 failed in building a stable and democratic government. Nor did it provide sufficient results in terms of poverty reduction. 
Instead, a massive elite grab kept the people poor while a small elite became rich beyond measures. The strategy to win hearts and minds failed. And then the COVID-19 pandemic, closed borders, the freezing of international aid and the international sanctions regime has pushed most Afghans into poverty. Many you now ask themselves, and we have done this throughout this conference, if Taliban has changed. And this remains to be seen. But what is certain is that the people that they now govern have changed and will no longer accept to be kept in bond. Even Taliban will not, over time, be able to govern against the will of the people. Hope and faith in the Afghan people and our solidarity and support cannot depend on the government that is in place at any given time. So this is the reason why we are hosting Afghanistan Week. As we are not ready to give up and leave the people of Afghanistan to their own destiny at this critical time. So the, common sem the coming seminar will now um, point to the future and explore whether there are any opportunities in the sea of trouble. So I will now call on the seminar's moderator, Christian berg -Hartviken. Christian, he is the research professor at PRIO. He's a long-time student of Afghanistan and the surrounding region, and a frequent media commentator and lecturer. So please welcome Christian. Thank you, Lieb. We uh, are not ready to give up on Afghanistan. And as far as I can gather, neither is Norway and Norway's government. We will soon hear from Nor the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Anniken Wittfeldt. She is a leading politician of the Labour Party who has previously, amongst other things, served as a Minister of Children and Equality, a Minister of Culture, Minister of Labour and Social Inclusion. She has um, a degree in political science and history from the University of Oslo, which studies also at uh, the London School of Economics for the more academically inclined amongst the audience. The minister, unfortunately, will have to leave just after her talk. Uh, we will certainly be building on what she says in uh, our panel discussion later tonight. There will be no permission for minister bashing, as the minister will not be in the room, but of course, we uh, do very much appreciate the fact that we have the minister with us to talk about uh, Afghanistan. Minister, or Anikin, as we would say in Norway, we try to be informal, perhaps on the edge of being slightly too informal at times. In a recent talk that you gave at the University of Agder, the Jon Lilletun talk, you uh, talked also about the need for talking to the Taliban, even if you recognize that this is a brutal regime which does not recognize basic human rights and women's rights. And you said, we will not forget Afghanistan. We will hold the Taliban responsible. All our support to Afghanistan goes through the UN and international aid agencies, not to the Taliban. But I don't believe for a minute that Afghanistan will become a better country for Afghans if we refuse to talk to the Taliban. This, I would say, is a remarkably clear line at a time when there is much confusion, hesitation, and even reluctance to relate to the Taliban in any way other than through sanctions. And it's certainly not a line that everybody agrees with, but for that reason and for a multitude of other reasons, we are very much looking forward to what you have to say. Anniken Wittfeldt, stage is yours. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Afghanistan, many of you have worked very hard to support Afghanistan over the years. Humanitarian organizations, the research community have been and still are important part of the wider Norwegian engagement in Afghanistan. The Norwegian Afghanistan Committee, the Norwegian Refugee Council, Norwegian Church Aid, Norwegian Red Cross, 
the Peace Research Institute, Christian Mikkelsen's Institute, and other organizations as well. I hope that you realize how valuable your contributions are, but also a very valuable input when we decide on the government policy on Afghanistan. It is good to see that you have maintained your commitment to a country that has experienced such widespread hardship and suffering. As you know, massive challenges have taken place in Afghanistan since the Taliban took power last year. And for me, this is one image that comes in my mind, uh, which I think illustrates that very well. A bodyguard from the Norwegian Police Security Service, PST, who in January 2008 was at the Serena Hotel in Kabul to protect the then Foreign Minister, Jonas Gahr Støre. There is a media photo of this bodyguard in the basement of uh, Serena Hotel, with his rifle lifted, ready to fight the Taliban terrorists as they attacked the hotel and also killed civilians, including a Norwegian journalist. Then fast forward 14 years to January 2022 in Oslo, a media photo of the very same bodyguard. This time, he's protecting the Taliban delegation, including the brother of the man responsible for the Serena attack. For me, this is a very strong image. Not because of the bodyguard, he is doing his job in a professional way, but the image so clearly illustrates, firstly, that our former enemies are now de facto authorities in Afghanistan. We can dislike it, but that is the reality. And secondly, that overall has changed from fighting the Taliban then to now trying to convince the Taliban through dialogue. What has not changed is our goal, to stabilize Afghanistan by improving the life of ordinary Afghans. The security situation for most Afghans has improved. Terrorist attacks still occur, but fewer civilians are being killed in hostilities. But the Afghan people are contending with economic collapse, increased humanitarian needs, and restrictions on their rights. The freedom of movement of women and girls in particular has been curtained, as has their access to education and employment. The de facto authorities in the country, the Taliban, seem to have other priorities than improving the lives of ordinary Afghans. Thus, we, the international community, must do whatever we can to convince them that the well-being of their own people should be their first priority. In order to do so, uh, we have to talk to them, and the Afghans must talk to each other. Inviting the Taliban to Norway some 10 months ago was controversial. Perhaps the decision that has triggered, triggered most debate during my time as foreign minister. But I'm convinced that this was the right decision. Many people were surprised, others were angry, and I can understand that. But many also expressed support, such as the Norwegian Chief of Defense, General Eirik Christoffersen, and others who fought in Afghanistan themselves. That support from women and men in uniforms meant a lot. They understood that contact with those who are actually in power is essential if we are to help the Afghan people. Also, despite of the controversy, the invitation had broad political support. Only one party in the sorting of a parliament was openly against this. This general broad agreement on foreign policies issues is one of the Norwegian is one of Norwegian advantages, and one of the reasons why we could also invite them here. I did not meet with Taliban myself, but my state secretary did. And we did succeed in bringing them together, the Taliban and representatives from Afghan civil society. The talks 
also contributed to reduction and to reducing the humanitarian catastrophe. That said, it's still a catastrophe, but not as bad as we feared it could be one year ago. However, sadly, we can now say with certainty that the Taliban has not delivered on its promises from the Oslo meetings. They have not formed an inclusive government. They do not respect human rights. These are the main reasons why Norway and the international community do not have political, normal political contact with the de facto authorities. We will still not give the give Taliban political recognition. We will make it clear what we expect from them. We'll hold them accountable for violating of human rights and we'll continue to exert influence on them. Afghanistan is a complex country with stories of despair, but also of hope and resilience. Developments differ between provinces, providing challenges, but also opportunities. If history has taught us anything, it is that it's not wise to give up on Afghanistan. No one will benefit if the country descends into a civil war or becomes a base for international terrorism. The Afghan people need our assistance and support. Although multiple global crises are competing for our attention, the international community has not forgotten Afghanistan. This is clear from my conversation with counterparts from other countries. They want to talk with Norway about how we can work together to help the Afghan people, partly because one of the meetings in Oslo, but also because of our role in the, in the Security Council. Noah is the so-called pen holder on Afghanistan in the Council. It means that we write the draft statements and we take initiatives, for instance, convening emergency meetings, and lead the drafting processes and negotiation on Council statements and resolutions. We have managed to navigate divided opinions and ensure that the UN in Afghanistan has a robust political mandate, which enables us to monitor and expose human rights abuses and to facilitate inclusive political dialogue. The negotiations on the new mandates for the UN political mission in Afghanistan were particularly difficult this year. They took place just after Russia's invasion of Afghanistan. Despite different views, especially between the Western countries and Russia and China, we managed to negotiate a new mandate. It was adopted in mid-March, which support by all country members except one, Russia, who abstained. Norway has also led negotiations that have resulted in statesmen backed by all 15 members. The Security Council has sent clear messages on the human rights situation in Afghanistan, called on the Taliban to ensure inclusive governments of women participation in society, and to immediately reopen schools for all girls. Our effort in the Security Council have shown that the international community is clear on its expectations and demand of the Taliban. We all have an interest in preventing a state collapse. The Taliban's return to power led to an economic crisis and compound the humanitarian situation. Extensive humanitarian efforts enabled people to cope with the winter better than we had feared one year ago. Nevertheless, many Afghans are still facing food insecurity, unemployment and poverty. Many lack access to basic services. And there's an urgent need to strengthen protection against violence and abuse. Norway has increased its humanitarian support substantially. But humanitarian action alone is not enough. 
Norway has been at the forefront of effort to mobilize assistance over and above humanitarian aid, not for the Taliban regime, but to support Afghan people. We have listened to advice from many of you here today, and we have convened your views to the authorities in other countries. But we have actively encouraged also the World Bank and the UN and other donors to establish large-scale programs to promote food security, health and education, and to safeguard people's livelihoods. We also promote processes that increase macroeconomic stability, such as strengthening the banking system. And we have strengthened our efforts to promote human rights and women's position in society, for example, by funding continued access to sexual and reproductive health services. We have a pragmatic approach, aiming at finding the best possible solutions in an extreme situation. It is very cha challenging to work in a country where we cannot support or cooperate with the authorities in a normal way. There is still a long, long way to go. We will continue to argue for a pragmatic solution and maintain a high level of aid. This month, we will disturb, disperse ne nearly 220 million Norwegian crowns to the World Bank and UN. Our aid to Afghanistan this year will be higher than last year, totally more than 700 million Norwegian crowns. Promoting conflict resolution and reconciliation is a key component of Norway's foreign policy. Since January, we have met in Afghanistan with both the de facto authorities and the Afghans. We have met with the Taliban representatives in Doha on our own and together with the international colleagues. In all these talks, we have communicated our expectations very, very clearly and conveyed the expectations of the Afghan people. Some people are questioning the point of continued dialogue when there appears to be no constructive response. My answer to them is that the alternative to dialogue is much worse. We must avoid a humanitarian disaster. Aid workers must, must have access and space to carry out their work. And the Taliban must be reminded of Afghanistan's international obligations. Our international partners and many Afghans encourage us to continue to facilitate talks, both with Taliban and between the Taliban and other actors in Afghanistan to help stabilize the country. So we will continue to pursue dialogue whenever possible. One of the challenges we face is that the people we meet, those in the de facto administration in Kabul, are not the ones talking, taking the important decisions. The supreme leaders and his inner circle are in Kandahar, and they not have the habit of talking to foreigners. We are constantly assessing how to maintain dialogue, how to access the real decision makers. Should we step up our dialogue with authorities in districts and provinces? Are there more effective ways of communicating, communicating our message? We are not the only Western country that is talking to Taliban. We cooperate closely with like-minded countries such as the US, Britain and the EU. The cooperation is crucial because countries whose values differ widely from our own should not be the only ones to influence Afghanistan. That is not in our interest, nor, I believe, in the interest of Afghans. But even these countries largely agree with us on the basic, of basic message. We have seen this in the Security Council. 
everyone is concerned about the fact that girls in Afghanistan do not have access to education after primary school. Everyone agrees that it is important to prevent international terrorist organizations from gaining a foothold in the country. And everyone is worried that the Taliban monopoly of, on power poses a threat to the country's stability. In fact, there is a remarkable degree of international consensus regarding Afghanistan. No country has normalized its ties with the de facto authorities, and no country stands to benefit from Afghan destabilization. Of course, different countries have a different approaches, but we have a common ground to base our efforts to stabilize Afghanistan. The UNAMA mission should take the lead in translating this consensus into joint international action. And of course, we speak with Afghan civil society, people who work hard to make a difference. At the Oslo Forum in, in June, I met with five Afghans who are working to bring about change. Yesterday, I met women who promote women's rights and women's rights, they may, might, yeah, you are here this evening. And they told me about the harsh realities for women in Afghanistan. They have been making demands of both the Taliban and the international community. And I listen carefully when they speak because they know where the shoe pinches the most. The human rights situation in Afghanistan is critical. An issue we always raise and will continue to raise in our contact with the Taliban. In addition to the severe rollback on the rights of girls and women, there are reports of killings, abuse, detention, and inadequate legal safeguards. Religious and ethnic minorities are regularly subjected to attacks. Freedom of expression is greatly curtained. Working conditions for the media are extremely challenging. So far, pressure from the international community has not led to any improvements. Still, we must continue our efforts. We have increased our support to organizations that promote human rights in Afghanistan, including civil society organizations and grassroots initiatives with a special focus on women and girls. We fully support the human rights effort on the UN, including robust mandates for the Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan and UNAMA. The Special Rapporteur, appointed by the Human Rights Council, Mr. Bennett, has been allowed to visit the country twice and has access to the de facto authorities and civil society representatives. That is one positive development. The th threat from, of terrorism has increased in Afghanistan. The IS, or Islamic State, tries to undermine the Taliban control of Afghan territory. The group has carried out terrorist attacks on minorities, such as Hazars. They express the aim to attack foreigners in the country. They pose a threat both with the region and also internationally. The US attack on Al-Qaeda's leader made it clear that uh, Al-Qaeda is still, still present in Afghanistan. The UN Security Council has adopted a number of resolutions stating that Afghan territory must not be used to plan or finance terrorist acts and to shelter and train terrorists. We expect that the de facto authorities to comply with Afghanistan's obligations under international law in this area. Many Afghans who have close ties to Norway were granted residence here after Taliban took power. I know that they have been thought a difficult transition. And I know that many are passionate about their home country. In the end, the future of Afghanistan is for the Afghans to, to decide. 
But there are many of us who care and many of us who want to help. This week's focus on Afghanistan shows that there are many people in Norway who are engaged and who want to contribute. Norway has a long history of engagement in Afghanistan. Thousands of Norwegian women and men have served there in military uniform. Many, both soldiers and civilians, have sacrificed a great deal. We honor the memory of the Norwegians who sacrificed their lives in Afghanistan. Scores of Norwegian aid workers, researchers and diplomats have in depth knowledge of the country. They have Afghan friends, some of whom have fled, and some who are still in the country. The constructive cooperation between the Foreign Service, the aid organizations, and the research community on matters relating to Afghanistan is of tremendous value and the base for our continued assistance. Norway has not forgotten Afghanistan. Our engagement continues. We must continue to be pragmatic, to look for opportunities and find new creative ways of helping the Afghan people as the situation evolves. Thank you. Thank you, Anniken Littfeldt, uh, Minister, for uh, those words. Um, I think you have read our minds when it comes to what we uh, hope to discuss later tonight. Thanks also for being so remarkably clear, uh, not only on Norway's commitment, which I'm sure everybody would approve of, but also being so clear on the choices that uh, Norway takes in this difficult situation, many of which I'm sure there will be more discussion about, but by being so clear, you are also enabling our discussion. So thanks a lot and good luck with the rest of the evening. I will now invite onto the stage uh, a very distinguished panel, Masoud Karukhel, Shagul Rezaei, Roxana Shapur and Harie Magnussen Watterdal. Masoud Karukhel is the, uh, please, Come to the stage and find your seat places at these two tables. Masoud is the director and co-founder of the Liaso offices, office, which was established 2003 in uh, Kabul. He has followed Afghan developments for a lifetime. He works in uh, research, peace building, and supporting livelihoods, and we're very glad to have him here. Masoud is... Uh, still based in Kabul and continues the work that he has been at for the past three decades. Shagul Rezaei is a human rights and women's activist. Shagul was also a member of the uh, Wolesi Jirga, the lower house of the Afghan parliament. She, she hails from uh, Ghazni province. She has also served as a member of a number of the key commissions within the parliament, such as the Commission on Women's Affairs, Civil Society, and uh, Human Rights. Shagul now resides in Norway, and it's a real pleasure to have you with us, Shagul. Roxana Shapur is uh, an analyst of the Afghanistan Analysts Network. She has uh, extensive experience working in Afghanistan for the BBC, for uh, several UN agencies, UN agencies and uh, non-governmental organization. She has also worked as an advisor at the Afghan Ministry of Finance. And least, but not la last, but not least, least but not last, that didn't come out right. <laughs> Sorry about that, Tarje. Uh, hope you'll forgive me. Uh, already. <laughs> Tarje is an economist. He um, is also very engaged in education and disability rights. He is the country director for the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee, uh, and he has extensive experience working as an advisor to governments in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia, as well as as a senior expert for several UN agencies in Afghanistan and uh, elsewhere. And I think we are diving straight into the substance, and I want to start with you, 
Masood and start very close to where we find ourselves now, namely in uh, Oslo. And in January this year, and the minister did discuss this, Norway hosted a meeting where the Taliban met with representatives of uh, Afghan civil society, with aid organizations, and with the representatives of the UN, the US, and a number of other Western countries. At home in Norway, the government was strongly criticized for giving the Taliban red carpet treatment, or a private business jet, as it were. And while the meeting was envisaged, strategically envisaged as the start of a process, rather than an arena for really making firm commitments, the Taliban's reversal of its promise to reopen high schools for girls made the hoped for follow-up meeting very difficult. So I want to pose to you, having followed this from Kabul, was it a mistake by Norway to invite the Taliban to Oslo? Was the whole Oslo meeting a mistake? Or should it have been done differently? And in the extension of that, how can we now, given the failure of the Taliban to deliver on the commitments made in Oslo, envisage a structured dialogue with the Taliban? Something the minister also talked about in her talk. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for having me and good to be here. Um, to the question, how did we feel back in uh, Kabul or in Afghanistan? Um, I, I think one of the messages from Afghanistan, from civil society, from the Afghan population is that uh, dialogue is necessary. Uh, it should be continued and one of the key messages is that uh, Norway should play this role in uh, continuing this dialogue. Now, in terms of protocol formalities, that's one side of the question, but uh, Afghanistan conflict is not um, something which uh, was, we can link into 15th of August. Afghanistan has been in conflict for more than four decades, and we should not forget this. Uh, the society has um, traumas which are very deep and much longer than 18 or 19 years. Uh, for that purpose, Afghanistan doesn't only need dialogue with support of Norway, uh, perhaps a continuation of the dialogues in Oslo, but also we need um, discussions at the local level, at the national level, and perhaps at the regional level as well, as, uh, as to address the different dynamics, uh, how social healing can begin, um, how communities can coexist, um, and how um, a, a society that has been traumatized uh, the answer is not only humanitarian aid, uh, but also compassion and how a society could come out of this uh, long uh, sense of victimhood. Um, the issue of uh, human rights and women rights and, and girls' right to education, um, I think this can only be dealt with through dialogue. I think um, I appreciate that uh, Norway is looking at uh, continuing supporting Afghanistan and it's not a forgotten nation because um, I'm not uh, the only person in that country working. There are many of us working, both international NGOs, local organizations, men and women, uh, our colleagues. Uh, we have been dealing with the authorities. Uh, most of our programs are registered. Um, I do believe that there is a space for civic uh, dialogue. The question is how do we now build and expand this and reconnect this? Um, and this confidence or this lack of uh, talking to each other in the last 18 years particularly, uh, Afghan society had limited access to the dialogue in Doha. I think now is a good opportunity that how dialogue can be more inclusive um, and um, how all Afghans can feel more ownership. I think that has been one of the flaws of past pro processes in Afghanistan. Uh, I think also what uh, the message to Afghans here is also that we need to take ownership more. That's, I think, one of the biggest lessons learned. Uh, and uh, we need to talk to each other. And uh, we all are part of the reality of that society. Um, so henceforth, I think uh, these issues on that we have a discussion and um, can only be dealt through dialogue and more engagement. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot, Masoud. That's uh, a very good starting point for our discussion. I, I want to follow up with one question to you. Um, the way I understand it, despite 
the admittedly very repressive policies of the Taliban. There is also huge variation across various localities and various sectors in the Taliban administrations. And there also seems to be quite a few people within the Taliban who are at least somewhat receptive to public concerns. But what I want to ask you about is what the implications are, and you already started to address this, what the implications are for indigenous civil society and for the relationship of the external world to that civil society. Um, we have seen many civil society organizations collapse in the context of the withdrawal, but how should the external world now relate to Afghan civil society? Should we leave it alone? Is there a need for support? Are there some sorts of support that would be more beneficial or least less, less harmful than, uh, than others? Uh, good question. Um, um, a few things. Um, first of all, um, Afghan civil society doesn't necessarily only mean um, NGOs. Uh, but I think we need to consider the broader spectrum of Afghan society, including traditional civil society, uh, Afghan media, Afghan um, women, youth, uh, and Afghans from different walks of life. Uh, I, I would say that, especially in the last one year, um, there is a lot of talk of that um, um, and a sense of abandonment in Afghanistan. After a very extreme engagement, suddenly, uh, for the last 14 months, there was more focus on evacuations and more focus on humanitarian aid. But in a way for the society to, you know, continue their work, mm -hmm. to be that bridge uh, in interlinking various societies, uh, that voice has been greatly diminished. Um, and that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does. And, um, and we need to work on this. At the same time, civil society has to uh, built on that, uh, if we're talking about women's rights, for example, uh, how men and women can work together on this topic. So we cannot just exclude into smaller components, but how as a society we have equal rights and work together. So for that purpose, I think uh, there is support needed. A lot of uh, capacity uh, was lost um, post-August 15 with the evacuations. But that doesn't mean that nothing exists on the ground. Uh, I've been hearing various examples, and I'm sure uh, that there are other actors also working. Uh, so it's not a doomsday uh, that, uh, as I said, there is uh, work that, for example, just some of our colleagues were uh, visiting right now and meeting civil society in provinces, and that opportunity is there. You can meet and you can discuss uh, these topics. We do deal with various line ministries that are relevant to us and uh, we and uh, and that's very easy to so I don't say that you don't work, but we do get permission to work, um, and uh, and the question is that how we can be constructive at this point. Um, I think that's why looking at these issues, uh, civil society um, has also not only been looking at issues of funding, uh, but rather also how do we um, build that legitimacy locally. And I think whatever support can come in that. Uh, direction, it should not be only short-term, but more long-term thinking. Uh, we have a very vibrant and a vocal uh, civil society now in diaspora, um, but I do feel like the, the context understanding is uh, there's a widening gap. How do we reduce this? How do we interconnect and uh, work with each other? not only for individual or for, um, you know, for specific program, but for the broader uh, national interest at this point. I liked how uh, the minister um, earlier spoke about uh, uh, Norwegian men and women in uniform, uh, but Afghanistan also, for example, had a lot of um, casualties if we just take the last 18, 19 years. Uh, and I think for Afghans here and Afghans back home, uh, we also owe it to our people. And, and you know, it's like 40 years of conflict, so many Afghans died. Um, so it's time to um, uh, think of civil society a bit broadly and not sort of limited to urban, but we also have to look at the issues which also exist at the ruler level as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Masoud. Uh, you bring up a number of issues that I'm sure we will uh, we'll get back to, but thanks for reminding us that uh, there is still civil society activity in Afghanistan and that there are spaces in which it may even 
have an, um, an impact. And I think the, the issue of the diaspora and the relationship between the diaspora and those who still are in Afghanistan, which of course eventually are most Afghans. We have to, <laughs> we have to be realistic about that. That's an important issue. And I, I want to pick up on that and move on to you, Shargul. Um, this is something that you and I have discussed quite a bit. And I'd like to hear from you uh, within the Afghan diaspora. Of course, we all realize that there is a lot of competence. Uh, there is a lot of political energy. Uh, uh, and there are also many that feel that they are let down by foreigners. Many have lost a lot. Many are even angry. Uh, perhaps most are angry to some extent for very understandable reasons. And I also see, and I think Masoud touched upon this, that there are strong divisions not only within the diaspora, but also between parts of the diaspora and those still in the country. But I think the ultimate question is how is it in this situation that members of the diaspora can best engage in order to eventually contribute to bring about the desired change in Afghanistan? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm glad that there are a lot of uh, Afghanistan friends. It is a good idea that we have at least in this room a lot of friends from Afghanistan. <laughs> Uh, we want to thank you for Afghanistan Week program as well. Uh, you ask about the role of diaspora. Um, actually, uh, uh, those persons who are fighting inside Afghanistan are our hero. It is the reality and we should respect their fighting for human rights, for women rights, and for many values that we believe. But about the role of uh, diaspora, I, um, uh, we know the situation of Afghanistan. Any protest, uh, uh, regarding the human rights or women rights are uh, responded by uh, torture, imprisonment, and uh, repression. So in that situation, there is a little chance for uh, those who are inside of, the people, uh, of Afghanistan to protest against the Taliban regime. That is why I think the diaspora is a big chance to raise their voice uh, loudly in different country. Uh, I, I think that diaspora like an unofficial ambassadors to Afghanistan people, Afghan people, because uh, we have official ambassadors here, but uh, diaspora like, uh, work like an official uh, ambassadors because they want to say the reality of Afghanistan. Uh, ambass uh, Minister, Madam uh, Minister uh, discussed about the last year uh, uh, program in Oslo. I was uh, part of that. Actually, we raised the reality of Afghanistan. We said that Taliban is not the only reality in Afghanistan. Civil society, uh, women, uh, women rights defenders, and all persons who uh, have belief on women rights and human rights and values, they are the part of uh, uh, Afghanistan's reality. I think that um, uh, in 2021, uh, uh, when we consider, uh, when we see the uh, the number of uh, uh, refugee or diaspora, most of them are women rights activists, most of them are journalists, Mo most of them are um, uh, political active or civil uh, activ uh, activists. So they are um, the ability of Afghanistan, they are the capacity of Afghanistan. They can raise the voice for those who, people who cannot raise their voice. Uh, we uh, only want to share uh, two success uh, 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 example of uh, diaspora. Uh, you know that uh, last month, uh, uh, 45 uh, young girls were killed in uh, educational center Kaj. A lot of Hazara people uh, demonstrated. At least at the same time, we had demonstration in more than 100 cities in the world. It is the role of diaspora. At least we went to Twitter and uh, used a uh, hashtag of stop Hazara genocide, more than six, 16 millions. It is the role of diaspora. Another example is the women. We created coalition of women from different country. Different uh, people uh, are living in exile in different countries. We created a coalition. And all the time we want to meet, we want to have discussion with international community authorities. We, we, have, uh, we had discussion 
uh, with um, the special reporter. We had discussion about the uh, United Nations authorities. We had a lot of trip and we discussed the situation of Afghanistan. I think this is another uh, good example that we can say. Another thing that I want to raise that it is our responsibility to do that. Why? Because we are the generation that grew in 20 years and we use from the source of Afghanistan from the chance that we had in Afghanistan. That is why this is our responsibility to, ro to raise the voice of those people who don't have the voice now, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shagul, and thank you for being so concrete with examples uh, as, uh, as well. One issue that you already touched upon is the issue of women's uh, situation uh, in Afghanistan, and the minister also spoke uh, at length about that. And as we all know, that situation has become extremely difficult under the Taliban regime with new restrictions imposed virtually every day. And again, not talking about primarily the diaspora, but the other types of external actors, states, international organizations. How is it that they can contribute to at least the situation not worsening, or perhaps even uh, constructively supporting Afghan women and expanding the protection, uh, their rights, hopefully even in a more distant future, their possibilities for political participation? Um, as I said before, uh, the history of Afghanistan, the history of uh, women's struggle for their position or their rights, should remember that one time in Kabul, uh, a, young, a group of young girls demonstrated for their basic rights, while the men of Afghanistan was in silence. And another big question that what uh, I should ask this question because what is the uh, what, what is the real meaning of uh, women pro, uh, women participation and rights in the world when in part of the world in 21st century the girl cannot uh, don't have the permission to go to school it is a basic rights it is a fundamental rights for everyone in 21st century. Uh, now Afghanistan is the only country that half of its population have been ignored or completely removed from the public life. Women of Afghanistan are deprived from all their rights. We, we heard that uh, repeatedly Taliban promised international community that we, we will open girls school, but they didn't. I think that uh, women of Afghanistan are in the most difficult stage of their struggles. Why? Because uh, there, was, uh, there is an unequal war between women of Afghanistan and Taliban. Now, the only tools that Afghan women have, their knowledge, their education, their capability, and their idea or their belief on justice or equality. But Taliban use from all tools, all instruments, to delete, to remove women from all public life. This is an equal fight, and we should recognize that as a reality. But what we can do, uh, I think um, uh, I'm not so optimistic, because uh, sometimes, yes, we, I believe that there, will be, there should be um, negotiation in local level, in regional level, or, or in international or in national level uh, with Taliban. But the most important thing is that when we want to solve the problem, by root, it is uh, when there is no a system, a protection system based on law, mm -hmm. how can we guarantee the women's situation or the rights, women rights or, or okay, human rights? The most important thing is that with cr cross-sectional negotiation with, uh, with Taliban, we cannot solve this problem. Because one time we discussed with Taliban, they will open one school from one part of uh, Afghanistan and they will open another school to another uh, part of Afghanistan. But uh, two days later, 
the same time, the same thing is, uh, will be happening. That is why I think uh, this is the time that we should discuss very uh, deeply, and we should consider the problem of Afghanistan uh, very deeply because I have a lot of concern. Sometimes I advocate for opening girls' schools, but at the same time, I have some concern in my mind because when they open the school, we don't know what is the curriculum, what will be teach them. After five years, maybe we have 5,000 uh, uh, bomb explosion uh, from girl, girls' uh, schools, so it is a problem. So that is why I think um, as we struggle for our rights, for our position, uh, in many years we, cap, uh, we come up and down for our rights. We, you know that uh, every woman in Afghanistan started their struggle from the village. I started my struggle for women's rights, for equality, for freedom, for, for human rights from the village level. At the end, when we consider the achievements, in short time, in 20 years or 15 years, we had a lot of achievement. But after 20 years, we get back, we return back to zero point. It is not easy for Afghan women that returning to zero point, it is a painful feeling that we, we think that we lost all our achievements in, in one day or in one night. What can we do? Uh, I think, um, as I explained, that maybe there is a chance, a little chance, to have discussion with Taliban in local level, in village levels, in district level, or in province level. Actually, or we should have uh, a discussion with Taliban in national level that I am not so, um, so um, happy with that, but because there is no enough chance for that because they uh, don't recognize women as a citizen, equal, uh, have equal rights with, with men. But the most important thing I want to emphasize, it is the basic thing that there should be a system, protection system for women based on law and regulation. Otherwise, we cannot hold Taliban accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shagul. And your, your answer is uh, far better than the question, because the question is difficult and perhaps also slightly over-optimistic. But I think you, uh, you give us a proper reality orientation, and at the same time, you are uh, examining the real, the real opportunities that may be there. So thanks for that. Roxana, I want to move on to you. Uh, the Taliban has, in many ways, proven remarkably resilient in the economic domain, sought to gain maximum independence, it seems, by pursuing their own sources of income. Um, and they also seem fairly indifferent to uh, attempts by outsiders to sway their opinion, whether that is with uh, sticks or with carrots. And I'm curious, because you told me that you had recently been examining the Taliban's quarterly budget quite carefully, and when it comes to the Taliban's political priorities, their objectives, I think it's interesting to exactly follow the money. How is it that they want to prioritize the scarce resources that they have at their disposal? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, actually, they've been quite opaque about uh, a lot of their financial, uh, uh, not only, uh, not only, uh, domestic resources that they're raising, but also their expenditures. Um, so we have to make educated guesses based on the information that is available in the public domain that they've made available. And one is the quarterly budget that they released for the last quarter of, um, of the, the year, financial year 14, or the Afghan year 1400. And that was very interesting because when you look at the development projects, which were a, a, like a small minutia of, of, what, uh, of the quarterly budget, um, it was very telling of something like 1,200 development projects that had been included in the Republic's um, last budget of the 1,400 budget, the Taliban re retained about 300 of them. And so they all had monetary values attached to them and many of them had budgetary allocations. And then some of them didn't have uh, budgetary allocations. So the need was clearly stated, but there were no budgetary allocations. 
And for me, personally, looking at this budget, looking at what they chose to keep from the 1,200 uh, projects, many of them, by the way, these um, 1,200 projects were unnecessary and they were a kind of extortion exacted by many, some MPs to get the budget past the finish line, but nevertheless, um, I thought this is an indication to the donor community of what the Taliban is prioritizing. What are we gonna spend our own money on and what we would have spent our own money on had, the, had we the money, but we don't, so we're telling you how much we need, a sort of tacit invitation to see what the priority are, prior, prior, priorities are that the donors could concentrate on. And so what we see is uh, a big emphasis on big infrastructure projects, things you can see, uh, things that the citizens can also see and feel. Um, so this is road building, electricity projects, uh, a good deal of support to agriculture and rural, rural livelihoods, as it were. Um, and so, even though, so the, the point of this and the reason we started looking at this, uh, uh, or we started down this road of an exercise to look at this was because um, we wanted to be able to ascertain and report on um, <clears throat> how the donor community could engage constructively with the Taliban uh, using the information, that, the little information that was available. They have done very well with revenue collection. There's uh, significant evidence of that. That's not necessarily good um, because uh, the, this heavy-handed taxation of rural communities is not, uh, it is devastating household economies. Uh, but on the other side of it, um, there, there is enough for donors as they try to figure out how they are gonna engage and how best to support the ordinary Afghan people improve their lives. Um, there's enough information to see what the Taliban are open to and what they believe their priorities are. Super, thanks a lot. That's, um, that's very, very interesting. If we turn the gaze outward, not as far as to Oslo, but uh, somewhat more short distance. Uh, many, uh, expected that the region, the neighbors of Afghanistan, would at least to some extent step into the void left by the, uh, by the withdrawal of uh, international forces, international aid presence, and uh, start to engage in some aid provision to the new rulers in, in Kabul. And that seems to have been taken place at best to a very limited extent, some would say even only to a symbolic mm -hmm. extent. Um, but at the same time, Western donors <coughs> seem to be insisting on not supporting the Taliban whatsoever, and therefore abstained from developmental support. How does the Taliban relate to this? Are they concerned at all about aid being withheld? Would developmental aid necessarily uh, be fostering support for the Taliban if they were to get some influence on the distribution of foreign aid? That seems to be a basic mm -hmm. assumption for most Western governments. And, and what would it take to get from where we are now to initiate more long-term more long term support? Wow, isn't that a $30,000 question? Um, Three $30,000 questions, probably. Or $300 million <laughs> I'm not. I'm not requiring yeah. any charge. Uh, but um, it's a very good question, and I think it's a question uh, that's on everybody's mind. Is, uh, I think, um, well, I think that they have communicated quite clearly their, uh, d their desire and their need for international donor support. They've, they've, they're on the record as articulating that more than once. And in fact, they say it every time there is an opportunity to communicate that. Uh, and that goes obviously hand in hand with their call for being recognized, um, which is seem to be their two big occupations with the international community. The, the, the donor community and the international community for its part, um, 
you know, it, it's, it was heartening to, to hear uh, the foreign minister once again reaffirm the IC's uh, commitment to the people of Afghanistan and its commitment to improving the lives of ordinary Afghans. Um, and also to go through all the various uh, uh, um, areas of focus. All of that was heartening. Um, but there, there are some problems here. So one, one issue is that humanitarian aid alone is not enough, and I think that we all agree with that. Humanitarian aid will keep Afghans alive today, but in order for us to really improve the lives of ordinary Afghans, we need to be looking at long-term resilient solutions. Uh, also looking at protecting state institutions, protect, protecting the investments that we made over 20 years in developing state institutions, of building the capacity of Afghans, including Afghan women and most importantly Afghan women. Um, and this, I think for me, uh, it becomes the heart of the problem that the donors are, are uh, caught in this di dilemma of how to do this and they're having a difficult time mm -hmm. reaching a consensus amongst themselves on the best ways to proceed uh, in this issue. It, so now we're seeing some moves that the, the money that has been committed to the multilateral funds and particularly the World Bank Managed ARTF and the UNDP Ab ABD fund is um, quite uh, heartening, mm -hmm. uh, but also, those funds um, risk uh, modalities that would see the donors and the implementing partners, uh, the, the UN and the World Bank, create parallel institutions. And that we must uh, try to avoid uh, quite strenuously because then dismantling these parallel structures would be extremely difficult when the time comes. Thank you, thank you. Tarje, you have, um, you have been serving as the uh, country director for the Norwegian-Afghanistan Committee for soon to be a decade, I gather, starting in 2013. And I, I wonder, from your perspective, how has the Taliban, Taliban's takeover affected your work? And are the lessons to draw from how it is that you operate that can uh, also be useful for how the donor community, what Roxanne just talked about, now approaches the Taliban and what conditions, not the least, that it uh, puts on uh, its commitments? Well, I think it's, uh, thank you, um, Christian. Uh, it's very easy to focus on the 15th of August, but the transition from the Islamic Republic to the Islamic Emirates started long before that. Um, of course, they have always controlled many rural districts, especially in the south, uh, southwest and southeast, but gradually also uh, controlling more areas in the north, areas that they never controlled back in the late 1990s when they were in power the first time. So we gradually got used to dealing with different power factors. And then what never changed, we have always kept the government at an arm's length. The former government and this de facto authorities, de facto government, the current government. So our approach is that we work with the Afghan people, um, whomever is in charge at one given time, we have to coordinate with, but they are not our main partners. So in many ways, things changed relatively little. And we first, the first office to be kind of taken over was our Badakhshan office in Faisalabad. And there were great fear. I was afraid for the safety of our colleagues. Uh, they were afraid. Uh, and then we realized that um, things were not great, but they were not as horrible as we had expected. <laughs> so parts of Afghanistan gradually got familiarized with a new way of life. 
uh, not accepting it, but being familiarized with it. They got used to a new government being in place. Um, and so it was a gradual process that, at least for us, helped the way that we work, the way that we functioned. And we had had this experience once before when Molestan was taken over by the Taliban, except for the actual tiny little district center a few years back. Ghazni city was overrun by the Taliban. So again, it was that gradual process of being accustomed to a new dynamic. And I think we all saw the writing of the wall, on the wall, when the Americans actually started pulling out. Uh, so um, today, our life, of course, is different. Um, the way that we operate, we have five regions, we have two and a half thousand people under contract. More than a thousand of those are women. Uh, in the five regions, there are three uh, women heads of regions. And we are fighting for this because the more restrictions this government places on women, on minorities, the more we will support. And that's, in a sense, is our silent protest against their policies. And I would actually encourage other organizations to do the same. This is, our, this is our protest that we can do practically on the ground, making sure that women have an income, making sure that all people of Afghanistan have access to work, to programs, to education, and to health. And of course, it is extremely painful to see the fact that most girls, grade 7 to 12, are out of school and prevented from having their education. Thanks, thanks, Tadia. It, it's been a long week of Afghanistan uh, events already. We started on Sunday, and on Monday we uh, screened the film Taliban Land by uh, Najib Kaja, who is actually here in the room, I believe, at the back, if I'm not mistaken. Hey, Najib. Uh, recommend everybody to see the film. It's a it's a brilliant depiction of uh, what. Uh, life looks like in areas controlled by the Taliban and how the Taliban themselves also reacted when they, when they came to power. Uh, but at the debate following the film, you described how in quite a few areas, Taliban leaders are receptive to, uh, to popular opinion. That doesn't necessarily mean that the whole population is out in the streets and screams with posters, but that there is <laughs> There are forms of dialogue which actually do change things. And I make, kind of make me wonder whether, whether we are seeing a trend towards more flexibility or are we seeing a situation in which there is some flexibility at the very outset after a transition and that eventually the regime is consolidating itself and those windows, those small windows or openings of opportunity at the local level are also closing, closing down. Um, I agree with Chagall that you know, dialogue on the national level is extremely difficult. Mm. Uh, it is easier on district and provincial levels. Because the thing is that, especially if those in charge are from that district or from that province, because the decisions they make on education, on health, on agriculture, is about their neighbors, their children, their brothers and sisters, it's close to them. It's easy to sit far away. I mean, we know that with the Americans and the way that they sit in Nevada sending drones into other countries and killing people. It's easy when that is that distance between the decision made and the impact on the ground. So I, I do, there is space for negotiations with people in the district level, on provincial level, is hard work. Also because they seem to follow the tradition of the past government that they are changing around people quite often. You know, people are making decisions, but they never have to face the consequences because then the next one is already in that position. So uh, it's a constant work. And, you know, we have, we have dialogue with Taliban every single day at the roadblocks in the departments, in the ministries, in the institutes, our people are negotiating access to the field. This is a daily 
It's a daily, really, really hard work. There are windows of opportunity. And I do think that it's important that we grab them. And I think we do have that possibility. Um, they are allergic to politicizing issues. So quietly, carefully, implementing change has an impact on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I visited, just before I came home to Norway, I visited the governor of Kapisa. And he asked me, please, can the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee open girls' schools in Tagab, which is the pastoral district of Kapisa, where there has never really been access to education for girls? Uh, the same when I went to Paktia, uh, two days later, the governor, district officials, want education. But the situation is different. It's different in Jaguri, is different in Malastan, is different in Maur, because the people who governs those districts are not from there. They are from Uruzga, they are from other districts and parts of Ghazni. So it's a very mixed basket, and I wouldn't say that this is a signal of a change, but there are these windows of opportunities. Some windows closed when restrictions are being introduced. Others opened when they allow us to make real change on the ground in villages, uh, in rural communities. Thank you. I want to soon open up for, for questions from the audience, but just one final question. And uh, whoever of you wants to pick up on this, feel free to do so. I don't expect you all necessarily to do so. Um, on Monday, we, we hosted a, um, a roundtable with, um, with Barney Rubin and Jon Sun from the Simpson Center. And Barney, Barney Rubin has recently released a report with the Simpson Center in which he argues that the international community really needs to draw up a roadmap so as to let the Taliban know what it would take to get what it wants. And you, Roxanne, mentioned some of the things that it potentially wants. So in other words, we know what the Taliban wants, but they have not been told what it is that the world expects from, from them. The report, that's why I'm looking at you, of course. <laughs> I'm going to just say two sentences, and then I'm going to step back and allow Madame Rezaei and uh, Karo Khilsaib to answer your question. From my perspective, I think this is crucial. It's the, it's, the, it's the necessary ingredient that's missing, and it's really emblematic of this donor's dilemma that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so, uh, which, when you, it's perceived as sending mixed messages. Mm. The, and the donors aren't actually sending mixed messages. It's just that there's no consensus and they also haven't gotten their head around what needs to happen and hence the dilemma. On the one side, the commitment to genuinely to help the people of Afghanistan and on the other side, um, their commitment to their principles and ideals and, uh, and uh, their red lines. So as such a roadmap would require all the donors to come together and really um, have some realistic conversations about the best way forward and what they want and where their actual red lines is, are instead of making uh, demands that then they step away from uh, in favor of actually being able to program uh, pro uh, pro uh, assistance to the people of Afghanistan. So I, from where I'm sitting, that would, that's the one thing that's missing. That would be incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to let <laughs> the Afghans answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> that was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Did again? The question was whether a roadmap, whether a roadmap uh, with, clear, uh, with clarity on what the expectations are from the Taliban uh, would be helpful. Actually, we should say some reality because uh, some reality from Afghanistan side, some reality from international community. The reality from international, that uh, after that we can say about roadmap. Uh, the reality from international community is that we should accept that now uh, in the world, uh, the strategy or um, uh, the most, uh, most of the strategy in the world are security oriented or benefit oriented. 
not values or oriented. We, at least uh, after one year from the Taliban, we exactly know that uh, the people of Afghanistan, uh, uh, this belief in force uh, toward people of Afghanistan that uh, Afghanistan uh, wasn't falling out. Actually, Afghanistan handed over. Uh, that is why we, according to that, we can have a discussion about roadmap. When we uh, consider the definition of uh, August 15, 2021, for international community, it is the end of a long and tedious war. For Taliban, it is a different definition. It is the narrative of victory over uh, 40 countries. But another stakeholder or uh, an important stakeholder or people of Afghanistan, they think that uh, 15 August 2021 is the beginning of a new chapter of crisis in Afghanistan. So when we consider these three parts or these three stakeholders, we can say, we can explain the situation or we can explain the roadmap. Actually in um, Oslo meeting, uh, we as uh, civil society or human rights activists, we uh, created a roadmap. We explained that first step, second step, third step, fourth or, or, or fifth. We explained and we uh, print out and gave this roadmap to international community, but didn't consider by international community because, because we know now Taliban are in the power and they have this power to secure or threaten the benefit of international community. But there is no force in Afghanistan is still, there, is still now that they threaten or secure the international community's interest or the different uh, countries' interest. So uh, what will be the, the roadmap? I think it is not so difficult. Yes, we had a lot of a bad experience from government, uh, go governance in Afghanistan. When we consider long history of Afghanistan, there is no point that we can say this is a successful point regarding governance in Afghanistan. All the time, we experience the failed government uh, governance, and all, all the time we have problem, and all the time there was a, a huge problem between citizen rights and uh, the uh, the authority or the uh, ruler. So it, it is the reality of Afghanistan. But regarding the roadmap, I think uh, um, beside of that, we should consider that uh, this, now this is not only Taliban. People of Afghanistan think we are at the end of the line. We are at the full stop points. From full stop points, we should start what? One, first of all, we should uh, uh, we should manage uh, at, at least we, we for uh, for respect to sacrifice made by international community and Afghan people. You know, uh, 92,000 soldiers were killed in last 20, uh, 20 years. It is 92,000 is not a number. It is 92,000 life, 92,000 family, 92,000 fathers and mothers. Who, uh, who lost their, uh, their, uh, their young soldiers. So in this situation, wh what will be the roadmap? I think uh, the international community uh, can uh, have a, a dialogue, create a dialogue based on social justice and human rights values, not based on wish wishes of Taliban first. Mm. The, second, uh, the second thing, we should introduce uh, many difficult, we should answer many difficult questions regarding our country. The second step should be that we uh, should, uh, um, we should decide about our future, about the government structure for the future, because we had a lot of problem. We, during, not only in 20 years, when we uh, look back in uh, long history of Afghanistan, we had a lot of problem. That is why we, the result of that discussion should be, should be the structure of the government that uh, based on wish of the people of Afghanistan. And the third one, we should, uh, who are the guarantee, or, or who should guarantee this discussion? We know that in Doha discussion, two months or three months or four months at least, or at least um, at the end, it was 10 months that only they discussed only on one word. One word should be there or should be like that. So uh, it, it should be a procedure. Mm. How can make Taliban accountable? I think, um, uh, 
uh, I discussed many times that uh, the message of international community is not so clear. Why? Because yes, there are many declarations that uh, beautiful words are there, but the main message should be that they, the international community should say to the Taliban very, very clear that you cannot continue as a government. I think only two options left for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, because if you consider that continuation of Taliban is a solution, is, it, it is, uh, it is uh, wrong, at least it is an unsuccess strategy. Only two way left. One, international community, with support of international community, is creating a negotiation based on justice, based on uh, human rights values, based on equality, or there will be, uh, Afghanistan will become another proxy battlefield for the future. You know uh, why I, uh, many of uh, you maybe heard about the Moscow format today, that um, Taliban don't have this ability to balance between the uh, um, different uh, benefits of different country in the region. So if international community think that continuation of the current situation or, or continuation of the Taliban regime is a solution that at least one, uh, one year we shows, uh, one year experience shows that they think as a solution. I think it is not a solution. Only solution is there. Afghanistan people will decide about that because we cannot control our people. Taliban think that we, by, by controlling, by um, repression, by torture, by violence, they can silence people. At the end of the day, the international community only uh, can uh, issue a declaration and condemn that. And this series will continue and will last for many years. No, it is not the reality of Afghanistan and it is not a success strategy for international community as well. That is why I think uh, the roadmap should be based on uh, finding a solution uh, through um, a political inclusive process. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's a very elaborate answer. Uh, I'm sure it's not the answer that the Taliban would have wanted. But then we are not here to please the Taliban. <laughs> of course we're not. Uh, but I think also your answer really brings home uh, the difficulties of the situation, the depth of the challenges that we are up against. And I realize, of course, that when I'm pushing the quest for opening solutions that I may say seem absolutely unrealistic in my expectations. And uh, I think you're, uh, you're providing us with a reality check. So thank you for that. Thank you. Anybody else wants to add something to this? If not, I'll open up for, uh, for questions from the audience. there was a, a concept that circulated, which was teapot diplomacy. And it was trying to capture what happened when you went to Kandahar to meet the Taliban leadership as a foreign diplomat, and your first word would be a criticism of their human rights record. Mm -hmm. Now, they certainly deserve every possible criticism of the way they deal with human rights, but it may still not be where you want to start if you uh, want to have an impact on their thinking. Mm. Any hands in the audience? Please. To talk about, about the situation and, and having that dialogue. But they didn't keep their promises. They, do, they are not interested in dialogue. So what do you mean by having dialogue or maintaining dialogue with the Taliban while they are not interested? Thank you. Do you want to respond to that straight away? No, uh, I don't know. Should we collect and then respond? We can, we can take a couple more. Please. Yes, my name is Ahmad Yasser. Um, I'd rather make a comment if it, and 
And then a short question. As long as it's not the talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My impression is that the panel is divided and the situation in Afghanistan depends also who you ask how, what is going on. Sure. It, it's it's very, really true. Some of us may uh, directly mention that Taliban is really cruel and they're brutal. Just look to their actions in Panjshir. Just look to the, their actions in Andarab. None of you have mentioned it. But, but, I, but it depends who you ask about in Afghanistan. Uh, my ma main comment is that it's an, an uh, extraordinary situation for the majority of Afghan people. No doubt about that. Uh, people are concerned basically how to survive and <coughs> not to live. So that's their primary concerns. I think few people think of uh, other things. Be uh, and they may uh, go out to protest, but they are afraid because it's a regime that will uh, repress them. And we have seen how young women and girls are treated in the streets of Kabul. That's the reality. And I, I'm, my impression again is that even the NGOs want to survive the new conditions. It's a new reality and it's tough time. Uh, they have the foreign privilege, access to the Taliban authorities, and that privilege is not available for the Afghan people. So my message is for some to, to try to um, uh, tell the realities on the ground for the people and, uh, and as you feel the Afghans are very divided both inside Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan. Uh, so that's a reality. And, and I want to <coughs> remind that when we talk about the Taliban, don't forget that I'm, I'm not lecturing. <laughs> This is a radical fundamentalist group that we have to do. They have an, an, an ideology and they have not uh, taken an, an, no step back from their, their main goals. Look at their uh, Sharia decrees, one after another coming and they are not giving up on that. So, and think of the consequences for the Afghan people the, the, the ordinary people, for girls, for, for women, and for, for other people group that not agree with the Taliban. So they have monopolized power and what that means for the ordinary people. I mean, uh, the situation is not, um, I'm not so op op optimistic about the, the future of Afghanistan and the international community, as uh, Shargo Rizai mentioned, uh, has a security approach. Uh, that's a, another uh, kind. Is my <laughs> impression of the situation wrong or that, do you see anything on it? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll take Can one more question. One more? Uh, Peter? <coughs> we'll, t we'll, take, yeah. we'll take one more question and then uh, turn it back to the panel and uh, there will be another opportunity. Uh, a few, just uh, some keywords, because with uh, Tarje, I mean, local ownership. I think that is, in a way, what the, like the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee is doing, working in the local communities, the local community see the benefit, then it's also possible to reach agreements with local Taliban leaders. But the other thing I think is very important that we are aware of is that, well, Norway and Western Europe is only a part of the world. Taliban is orienting itself towards Russia, towards China, towards Iran, Pakistan, countries that do not honor the same values. And that is part of the reality. And I think uh, when drawing a roadmap, also have to take this into consideration. And I think what was said, to discuss what kind of tone do we use in our dialogue is tremendously important. Because we have no, I mean, as foreigners, we have no leverage 
in forcing the Taliban to anything because they won. Okay, there's a lot to, to bite into here. Um, is dialogue realistic at all? And I think we, you in the panel, you've already distinguished quite clearly between the idea of a dialogue at the national level and the idea of dialogue at the local level. So that I think is an important distinction to, to bring with us. Are we underplaying the extent of repression uh, and the radical worldview that it is that the Taliban leadership is uh, is committed to, and vice versa, are we? Do we need to have a reality check and simply realize who it is that has the power now, and then on the basis of that observation decide whether that is something we want to relate to at all, or whether the better option is to just cut off all ties and uh, leave Afghanistan to itself. Pick and choose. Amongst the questions, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Masoud? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, that was um, so. Sir, to your to your question. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, I think it's very important, as um, also Christian mentioned. Um, we are not. The, um, I think sometimes we. Uh, like when you travel outside Afghanistan, uh, when I'm here, uh, you talk to multitude of actors, and um, and when you talk to UN and others inside Afghanistan, we are unfortunately no longer um, uh, one of the top priorities uh, internationally. Uh, we are sort of sliding down uh, the index. Uh, Ukraine, for example, is very much in. So for a country like Afghanistan uh, to have a platform uh, for dialogue, I, see, I agree with you, you need two sides or more than two sides to come and talk. Uh, that we need that more than ever because if that doesn't happen, uh, then we deal with all the other questions that were sort of left with a question mark, women rights, human rights, citizen issues, recognition, uh, um, humanitarian aid for how long, um, uh, recognition issues. Um, for me, uh, with an Afghan passport, as you're traveling over the years, uh, you're getting more and more difficult for Afghans to leave country right now, to go and attend the conference and speak. Uh, as I said, I'm, perhaps there are many more people who are more active, more vocal, uh, and have much more interesting things to say. But one problem is that they can't travel. Uh, uh, like there are no embassies that grant visas anymore. Uh, in the old, pre-August 15, there would be like 10 of us here, like 15 a couple of women, a couple of men from different groups and diversity, journalists and so on. So uh, for Afghanistan to remain relevant, um, uh, I think Norway has been involved in Doha level, has been involved in other conflicts around the world, trying to do, uh, doesn't have any border with us, so <laughs> they, have, they want our re resources or other strategic uh, priorities. Uh, so I think Afghanistan needs that kind of an attention uh, or a facilitator that can sort of bring sides together to discuss. Um, and uh, I mean, Wakila Saheb, as I mentioned, uh, the issue of what if things about war. Uh, the minister earlier mentioned the issue of chaos. Then we will have nobody to blame. Then we will have smaller groups in district level, maybe at provincial level or with few provinces to blame. At least now that's more that uh, we are talking about um, um, a government or a regime or de facto depends on how you see it. For us, they're the reality on the ground. Uh, they're the ones which uh, give you the license to work. Uh, that's where uh, they're the police on the road. So for us, the reality uh, on the ground is like this. Unfortunately, um, it's very difficult sometimes to give you our, my daily experience or of my colleagues, for example. Um, uh, yes, we have issues with education, or for example, women in public or politics or in other sectors. But for example, in private sector, um, I think also the more sanctions you have, the more limitations you have in the local economy, you will see less women having a reason to go out. Um, 
the women's staff in our Kabul office, uh, or the 150 female teachers we employ in Herat right now in three districts, for example, this will not exist. For example, these women will have no good reason um, to move around or what uh, other NGOs are doing that was mentioned earlier. So, but that's not enough. Uh, the small scale district level school here, clinic there, uh, this doesn't really solve our issues. Uh, issues of governance, for example, um, um, I think a roadmap, in my view, um, has to come from perhaps from this dialogue. We don't need a roadmap to begin with. We need a conversation. Uh, if you recall, pre-August 15, the Republic will say Taliban should come here and talk to us. Where is the Taliban leader hiding? I'm here, come and talk to me. Now it's the same issue the other way around. <laughs> now the Taliban are there and the opposition is missing. If you look at the 18, 19 years of Republic, we never had a political opposition in parliament. There was always a national unity government of some sort. We never really practiced democracy in its true sense on the ground. Uh, I remember towards the end of Republic, I didn't see any ethnic group which was happy. I don't recall like one ethnic group was like, no, we have all the power, we are very happy right now and we don't want any change. People were upset with cabinet, with parliament, with uh, international actors, with everybody, Taliban, everyone. Everybody had their own grievance. Uh, that's why um, I think a country like Norway, which is uh, influential, has a, yes, it is far away uh, from us. Uh, we have the neighborhood countries which are very important. I think uh, today um, uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Sharan made a good point that, you know, for the last 18 years, the Afghan sort of political younger generation, they very much focused on the West and not on our neighborhood. Uh, and uh, Iran, Pakistan, China, they're the ones which have embassies right now, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, and others. So uh, I think we were also a bit off in a, uh, that the international community will solve all our problems, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So that's the lesson, at least somebody who lived living in Kabul, I remember we had the spotlight, we will have uh, Turkish Airlines, Emirates, several flights every day. Now, it's not like that. Uh, either people are evacuating, leaving for good, uh, or the, the, the women working in our offices or in other offices, at least they have an opportunity or, you know, to do something. So, um, um, in, in, in terms of uh, instability further or proxy wars, we have a lot of people around us that want to create ethnic divides. And there's a lot of easy material uh, to do anything in Afghanistan. You can pick any issue and you can create a big um, um, catastrophe out of it. Um, but how will the issues of minority really improve? Uh, we need things on the ground to happen so they feel safe on daily life. I see for the first time women uh, selling uh, vegetables on a cart. This was not a very common sight in Kabul in the old days. You didn't see a woman selling, but this means that uh, she has no income. Uh, this upcoming winter is gonna be a very difficult, um, I mean, we talk about women rights, but what about uh, in a bad economy, prostitution, for example, increases. Uh, there are other human trafficking or people selling their children. And none of us, we want that. Uh, I think those who are here or those which are inside, we don't want this. Um, and change uh, the way we started uh, post 9-11 and post uh, the first Taliban government, there was a lot of enthusiasm and ambition. But I think on the way we lost uh, track, uh, too much uh, selfishism or division. I think um, there were good people. It's not like all of the Republic era people were bad. There were like a lot of honest, hardworking people. Uh, who try to do good. Uh, the question is that when we talk about casualties, as um, Mr. Zai mentioned, the Taliban also have very deep grievances if you talk to the foot soldiers. They say we also have been tortured, we have been killed, we have been imprisoned. Nobody, you, when, when we say civil society, it says when did you do a demonstration for us when we were getting bombed? So there are different, everybody feels there's a sense of uh, uh, that kind of a thinking. So. Um, um, therefore, I think we need dialogue, uh, both locally but also internationally, to facilitate that and to keep Afghanistan on the map when issues like Ukraine or other things that are uh, emerging. Uh, will there be enough money for Afghanistan, even for humanitarian aid in the future? There are many poorer countries all, all around the world um, that actually nobody is giving them anything or giving them too little. Um, uh, and uh, one last example. I was uh, quite younger when 
Najibullah's government fell. And when I came to Kabul from Peshawar, I remember all the ministries were looted. All the government vehicles had turned into private cars and uh, state property didn't exist, more or less. One thing which is good, like I go to the same ministries, at least the desk is there, the chairs are there, the air conditioning is there, or the vehicle that the previous uh, administration was using is still being used. At least, I'm not saying nothing was lost in this transition, I'm sure a lot of things were lost, but that gives me a bit of hope that uh, some of this country's property is still there. Uh, because, uh, you know, at least it's being used uh, to a certain level for the same, uh, for the purpose it was meant or with the taxpayer money of Western countries which was bought. So, so we have seen, uh, I don't want us to go into the 90s model again, uh, where you don't have the state and you don't have any infrastructure left and all the complex governance that has sort of evolved in Afghanistan, some of it is still there. Some of civil servants are still there in some ministries or some other technical stuff. We, we still need them in finance, in rural development, in health. Uh, and uh, so every, when every time a person leaves, imagine the 10 people which are left, they feel more down. So you cannot concentrate on your work because you say, oh, so and so left and so countries giving so many visas and so many countries giving so many visas. And so then you lose that attention. But we, have been, uh, we had the last exodus in 2014 and uh, then the second one in August 15. So um, I think out of the 30 million or 40 million people that we are, uh, I remember uh, there was always deportations back to Afghanistan and every flight I would take, there would be like a lot of young people on the flight with me uh, from Turkey, from Europe. And honestly, as an Afghan, I don't want to see that anymore when I travel. I want us to be respected. And right now I feel like we are burden um, sort of sense. Sometimes we see it as a victim that you know others did it to us, our neighbors did it to us, the world powers played with us. Uh, but there are poorer countries than us which are doing okay. They're selling coconut or palm oil, but so, sort of surviving. Uh, and we have minerals, we have other great things. We can make a lot of money out of tourism. I don't know how many Norwegians served in Afghanistan. I'm sure they all like to come back and visit Afghanistan. Um, you know, but of course, women rights, human rights, citizen rights, there's no, doubt that this should be handled, but um, I guess uh, it, uh, it will require us to keep on working and sort of dig that uh, hole in that mountain. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Masood. You. Could you be short, Terry? I, won't, I promise Sorry. one more round of questions. No, no, you're, that's fine, <laughs> Masood. That was... I think we, we see the reality on the ground. Of course, people see it from different angles. No doubt about that. Um, I think we have to face the reality, and this might not be popular to say, uh, we might face the reality that this government is here to stay for a while. And they can then, I think the, the first group to defeat them would be themselves. If they continue to have these restrictive policies, if they continue to act as you were talking about, that is going to be their downfall if they don't listen to the people. I was trying to say it earlier today that no government over time can rule a country against the will of its people. So um, I do think that there has to be a change. I'm not convinced about a roadmap with preconditions. I don't think it would work. A roadmap can be developed uh, together with civil society, together with people across the country, but ultimately, those who are currently in power, it doesn't matter what we think about them, they have to agree to this roadmap, not just in words, but in deeds. Thank you, Tarjen. We move back to three last questions, and remarkably, they are all gathered in a little cluster in green sweaters, <laughs> uh, and this, uh, the second and the third row, please. I mean, introduce yourselves. I know uh, who you are, but not everybody does. Thank you uh, for the panelists and uh, Kirsten for good moderation. My name is Zahir. I was born in Afghanistan. I have been living here in, in Norway for a long time now. I have two questions, and both of them are a bit difficult. Um, the first, um, as this, the last year since uh, August 2001, 
up to now we have experienced, the Taliban, as they consolidate their power, they get more repressive. We see no change. Um, so my question is that, what if it continues like that? I mean, is the international community considering the next step? Well, for now there are reports that Taliban receive every week $40 million in cash because the bank system doesn't work. So at the end they will say, okay, don't recognize us, send us money. It goes well. And th this is the first uh, question. The second is that I think there is a kind of reluctant approach toward discussing the ethnic conflict in Afghanistan. Taliban is not just a fundamentalist group, extremist group religiously, but they also want the Pashtun supremacy. And they, now we see that they exclude all the other minorities from the public offices, and they are much more brutal for example, against Hazaras or Tajiks or Wazbeks than Pashtuns. I mean, they are brutal against everyone. But when it comes to a Hazara or a Tajik, what they do in Daikundi, for example, or in Panche are much more brutal. Uh, as I'm speaking now, Taliban have ordered 4,000 family, uh, Hazara families from Daikundi to leave their villages because a Taliban commander supporter claimed their land. And the land grabbing is a structural uh, attack that has been going on since last year. So my question is that, do you see a kind of process toward Afghanistan, toward a balkanization? That's an issue. So these two questions, thank you. Thank you. We have one man without a green sweater uh, over here, which I neglected, so please. But I, please, I, please be short, because we, yeah. need to, um, we need to wind up fairly soon. And uh, we have my some closing remarks as well. Yeah. My name is Mustafa. I had somehow some similar questions. Uh, I was concerned about uh, uh, when it comes to talks and negotiation because for me it has uh, reshaped its name or uh, description because uh, it seems more like, uh, for me, when it comes to negotiation, it's more give and take uh, sort of thing. But now it seems it's more like international communities since last year, they've just given everything. What we have uh, got in return, nothing. So it's not, uh, we can't continue in that way. We should have our red lines. We should be tough on some, maybe on some points where that we should, we should have a stand. If you don't have a stand, a meaning, then you don't exist, in my opinion. So we should be tough in some uh, statements, in our statements. So they should reconsider maybe their uh, agendas or ideas. And the second thing is I'm thinking the, that uh, we have not mentioned is uh, a country cannot function or a society cannot function where there is no constitution. Because uh, everything is based on one person's uh, feeling or one person's ideas. Whenever he wakes up, he declares a new, uh, he issues a new statement. So how can we should, we are surviving every, each and every day and we don't know how the future looks like because he can issue any time any other statement. So it's so much uncertainty. So um, how can we uh, how can we uh, take a look on that issue? Thank you, Nurin. Three green three green sweaters. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Norun Grande from Nansen Center for Peace and Dialogue. And uh, my question is about dialogue, actually. Because we are all the time, or we are using the word dialogue, and I'm wondering about the definitions, how, what we mean when we talk about dialogue. When I heard our foreign minister, I was a bit uh, worried <laughs> about our official definition, if we have, of dialogue. Because when I heard her, it was, I heard her as if dialogue means to convince. That we are having dialogue to convince. Uh, our definition of dialogue is different. It is about dialogue to understand. Mm. And I'm wondering if it makes a difference. That is one question. And then I have another question, and it's about reconciliation. Uh, 
we know that or the Taliban have won a war, 20 years of war, and, but how, how should we uh, respond to that? To what extent do, we, uh, do the international community admit that they have lost a war? I think that is also a relevant question, because uh, when, when we, uh, we pretend, it seems to me, that uh, that is not the case that we have lost the war, but that, but the way I see it, we have uh, lost a war, and what consequences does that have uh, to how our approach? Would it make a difference it, if the, we admitted it more uh, publicly, or if the international community had a voice where we admitted also towards Taliban that this war is lost? And we go from here. And talking about the roadmap, I'm also quest my quest also have a question on that. How should this roadmap look like when it comes to a dynamic dialogue, actually, between the different actors to make an inclusive process for the future? Thank you. Thanks. And then please pass it on to Hasina. That's the last question. I wanted to catch up on the on the. Okay, first, I'm Hasina Shirzad. I work in Nonsense Center for Peace right now. Uh, I wanted to catch up on the part that we said the tone should change, but I didn't got exactly uh, like an idea in my head towards what should it be more strict or should it be a bit more softer? Because I think if you're talking about negotiations and a roadmap then Taliban are even not in that level that a roadmap should be given to them. I think we don't have a common language there. There is explicitly women rights, education, so many conditions have been put in forward which they are not responding to. But then if we are talking about the tone should change to a softer version and we should admit that international community should admit that they have lost the war, although I think that would even make Taliban more ignorant because they are using that right now in Afghanistan saying we all have won the war, we don't need to negotiate with anyone. But if we are talking about getting more softer, then I think in the table there should be something put in that if you do this and this, this is what we will offer. So what part are we talking about? Because I think we are right now confused to get softer or, or get harder. Which, what is the plan exactly? I'm confused. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> May quickly, I just, just before you respond, uh, Roxanne, uh, these questions are the material for three more Afghanistan weeks. <laughs> we have one minute left, so we can't possibly address them. I, <laughs> I, I have to apologize because as a moderator I failed. We will inevitably go over time. We also have closing remarks before we end. I understand some of you may have other plans. For those of you who don't have, hold out because there will actually be food and drinks and an opportunity to continue the discussion outside in a, in a few minutes. But we will go over time and if anybody has to leave, I fully understand that uh, will not cause any aggressive reactions from, uh, from the stage here. But uh, as to the panel, I ask you to pick and choose, not address all of these questions, because that would be absolutely impossible. Each of them merits uh, at least uh, a full day seminar to even start to define what they are about. And that's no criticisms because, criticism, because those are all excellent questions and comments, and I really wish we had time to delve, delve deeper into them, but we don't. So, a very short Basically, closing I'm statement. I'm going to take Hasina's question, um, but I do want to say that all of these questions were uh, important questions. And not only will they take um, up three, week, three other Afghanistan weeks, but also these are the questions that we should be deliberating and talking about amongst ourselves, both as Afghans and as those who serve Afghanistan. Um, I, I just want to clarify one thing for, I think there was a, when I say a roadmap for the international community is, I, I think what I mean is that the international community first needs to have a roadmap for itself 
the international community needs to agree amongst themselves what their approach should be, how their approach is going to be. This kind of consistent, uh, consensus doesn't exist at this time. And from where I'm sitting, it's, it's a serious problem and it's one of the big barriers. So I just wanted to clarify that. In terms of tone, you know in Farsi we say, they all mean the same thing. But the guy who hears it, it it's uh, sit, sit your behind down and please have a seat, basically roughly translated. The person who receives it has a different experience of what you're saying to them. They, with, with one, they'll be more receptive, with another one, less receptive to what you're saying. And when I say, a change of tone, I mean a recalibration to, so that we deliver messages in a way where they will, they're willing to hear us. That's what I mean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, I only want to maybe, there, there, was, um, there were a lot of questions and good questions, but um, I only want to focus on one. Um, uh, Mr. Zahir said that uh, Taliban hasn't changed in one year. I, uh, I was participated in dialogue in Doha in 2019. In that time, a TV asked me about the changing of Taliban. I said, uh, there is no change regarding Taliban mentality because uh, they are our ideological group and uh, we should uh, wait for that, but it is, there is no change. Uh, um, th about the other steps, uh, I think um, international community are tired. They think uh, there is no chance for a good governance, so uh, going back or, or, um, or um, interfering uh, to Afghanistan maybe uh, we, uh, for, the fair, uh, for the next time maybe a ca cause a lot of difficulties. That is why they, they think the, they want to be conservative regarding Afghanistan. But only two reality I want to say that uh, Talib, from the philosophy of formation, Taliban uh, are not built for the governance. They are and they were the proxy soldiers of a country to, to uh, continue the war and to uh, continue the instability in Afghanistan. So the, the philosophy of their formation was not for governance. The second thing that, uh, you know, in today's world, the legitimacy of the governments come from the law or from the satisfaction of the people. There is no law, there is no satisfaction of the people. They want to, uh, in any time, in any history, the repression and torture cannot be the source for legitimacy. History shows that those governments who use the torture and repression as only tools for the continuation of the government, they will lose the chance. They will not, uh, they will not be able to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Shagun. Um, Tadia? Yes, I think um, what you said, uh, Nurun, uh, we lost the war. Uh, for some people, we came as liberators. For other people, we came as occupiers. And I think we need to realize that. That's also part of the reality. Um, with the tone, and I think it was a, I don't think the foreign minister actually meant it that way, but she said that we have to talk to the Taliban. No, we need to talk with the Taliban. We need to talk with the opposition. We need to talk with people. Uh, and I think the arrogance of the West, um, I think they, most Afghans react allergic to our arrogance. We have tried to create an Afghanistan that we have mapped out. And it was very starch this morning, listening to, you know, just being, Karzai being dropped on the ground to say, okay, now you manage. Uh, this arrogance has failed Afghanistan. Uh, we are guilty of that. And uh, it's now up to us to support the Afghan people in rebuilding the country. We might not completely like that country that they built, but it's not up to me, uh, it's not up to you, you from Iran, me from Norway, to decide that. It's up to the Afghan people. And then with the Afghan people, I mean all Afghan people, Hazara, Pashto, Tajik, Uzbek, Turkmen, Arabs, Baluch, all 
Afghan people. So we failed and we should be humble. Thank you, Tadia. Masoud. Um, I think, that, as you said, there's no good or bad question. These are all very important issues. Just one thing that uh, I think the gentleman mentioned, the question of constitution. We, uh, I think that is the cornerstone from which governance and other things will become more clear. Um, there are, um, I, um, uh, that's not something that which every country needs, and I think Afghanistan needs, and that question is, is coming up uh, regularly um, inside the country as well, both from um, people and, um, and uh, so that will, I think, will be the cornerstone which, which, which will answer a lot of these questions that we have, future governance, rights of citizens, um, uh, and all this. Um, so um, I, I think build on, building on this question of uh, constitution, in my view, uh, uh, is paramount. Uh, that needs to be um, uh, something that in, our, in the dialogues on the ground, uh, in discussion, this is something that's regularly coming up, and it is not like, no, we don't need the Constitution, uh, but rather this, uh, this remains um, a key topic right now inside the country for the, all the population, regardless of um, um, the issue of their um, ethnicity. On the, I think the other thing which I would like to touch is the question of um, uh, balkanization that you mentioned. Uh, I, I personally, uh, this is something that I don't see something that is because of yesterday or six months, but this concern was there in my view five years ago as well, or even 10 years ago. Um, the issue of land conflict in Afghanistan has many roots and many dynamics. Um, some are very historical, uh, some are more recent, um, some are 18 years ago. Um, how do citizens get justice? I think this is very important, where people feel that they're being justly treated, whether it's rule of law. If in Norway you have a land dispute or property dispute, there is a court where you handle um, these uh, issues. Um, I'm, as a civil society, you call me, or as uh, some guy from Kabul here talking to you. Uh, I just have one thing. What, what we are seeing, we see this issue. And for example, one of the things we did uh, back in June, July, uh, that we have been trying to create these kind of platforms in different parts of the country. And one of that area was Bamiyan, for example, to bring this local civil society, women, men, together to talk about some of these issues that sort of are important to them, whatever those issues are, whether it's education or employment and so on. Um, as I said, these, these, these questions that you ha we have are, are very, they, they don't have a question and answer. It's not like you ask me a question and I say, oh, this is the answer to your question, so it's over. I think um, th there is no such thing like that. I'm not, uh, it's not a, uh, how to say, a medical problem. It's a, it's a social, political, lot of things combined. But the only way to solve it, in my view, or to find the conclusion is for us to work with each other. Uh, that goes back to the point of linking civil society, diaspora, locally. Uh, maybe there are things you can offer that will help. Maybe it's your expertise. Maybe you'll convince Prio to or you know, this question of understanding each other. Not, uh, I think in Afghanistan dialogue, we have mo mostly seen as to hear each, um, to hear our demands, but not to understand each other. And frankly speaking, when it comes to the question of victim, I, I have traveled the country recently and also in the past. Um, I, I feel like we have, as generally, people of that geography in that country, um, everywhere people feel victim for different reasons. Some say we didn't get enough aid. Some say we were bombed too much by the international. Somewhere you say people are being forcefully evicted from their property. Um, some feel, um, you know, different reasons, threatened, or their life or their family uh, being threatened, uh, or their way of life being threatened. So, as I said, I don't think so Norway can solve this for us, but uh, what we can, what, what if there are tools out there that can be brought in, uh, we should definitely take those tools, uh, but at the end of the day, um, uh, we need to do this ourselves, I think. Um, and that, that will be, how do we do it? It's not uh, easy. I wish if it was easy, there were many people doing it right now already. Uh, the international community needs its own roadmap. We Afghans inside the country or outside, we need our own roadmap. Uh, and uh, I see people in different parts of Europe 
or the U.S. sending money to a school or to a family during winter, you're all doing this already. But imagine if we combined all of this, uh, how much we could do. Um, so it's all very much, um, and for me, human rights or citizen rights is cross-ethnic. Every, uh, as long as you hold an ID card of that country, you should be treated as good as anybody else. And one should not feel like, oh, because he's so, he's privileged. Um, I think that's what we need to, um, um, if it existed in the Republic era or now, we need, we need to get rid of it. But uh, for that, we need to work with each other and we don't turn to be a proxy of someone else. I think this is also another issue that how we don't become a tool again uh, because we have been tools for too long, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Masoud. I, um, I found this discussion very, very informative and I take full blame for the fact that we've gone over time. We're not quite done yet. We'll have one last intervention, closing remarks by the ambassador, but I think we should uh, let the panel, sit down. You have been standing here for a long time and you have uh, brought lots of wisdom. We uh, remain with the many questions, but we have taken notes and we will get back to many of those questions. I think we uh, all realize that getting to roadmaps is difficult. I think you have also taught us and the questions taught us that conceptual clarity, actually knowing that we talk about the same thing when we say that dialogue is important, that engagement is important, or when we describe what the problems with dialogue is, that is uh, absolutely key. But thanks again, thanks to all four panelists, Terje Waterdal, Shagul Rezaei, Roxanne Shapur, and Masoud Karuche. And it's now my honor to call upon uh, Ambassador Gafur Zai, who will offer some closing remarks to this event. Ambassador Gafurzai has a long career with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. He has been a senior advisor on international affairs to the minister. He has served uh, 10 years at the permanent mission to the United Nations in uh, New York, and he has served as uh, the ambassador to Norway since uh, 2019. And this is the last intervention of the evening. Brief closing remarks by Ambassador Gafursai. Please, Ambassador. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and let me first start by thanking the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee and all other partner institutions for organizing this year's Afghanistan Week, which really does bring together a very impressive group of activists, journalists, and experts uh, for discussions on Afghanistan. I also want to convey a very special thanks to Her Excellency Foreign Minister Hoodfield for her very strong expression of support for Afghanistan and our people. And I can say with great confidence that Norway's commitment to Afghanistan at this very difficult time is valued and appreciated by all peoples of Afghanistan. Um, I also thank the panelists who shared their perspectives on how best to support a process that can meet the urgent needs of our people, including their right to live in real peace and to have their aspirations met. Obviously, this year's Afghanistan week takes place under very different circumstances in light of the Taliban's takeover last year. Afghanistan has faced a very dire and a very difficult situation, one of uncertainty, grave human rights violations, and other policies and measures that have undermined the spirit of national unity and which also contradict the true tenets of our religion, Islam. But our people have not lost hope. They are confident about overcoming the current situation, reaching a point of stability, and again, being able to determine their political destiny. In the past year and a half, the world has seen how Afghans from all walks of life display the courage and resilience which they have always shown in times of difficulty. They have defended national values to which they have always been committed, such as fundamental rights, liberty, and the right to self-determination. Afghan women and civil society have been the face of this now very historic struggle 
despite threats and intimidations. Their cause is about something more than just their own rights. It's about defending the rights of all Afghans. And it will be remembered in history as standing for what's right and, what, and what's desired and deserved by all peoples around the world. Thus, this year's Afghanistan week can be seen as a tribute to the courage of Afghan women who have also been an inspiration around the world. Meanwhile, let us not forget that their cause is no different than the cause for which many precious lives from many partner countries, including Norway, were lost. The sacrifice of our international friends is in no way seen as something separate from the sacrifice of our own people. So tonight, I also want to pay tribute to their memory and that of our Afghans, which should be another inspiration for all of us to help set Afghanistan back on the path of stability. Despite what has happened, the joint sacrifices made are not entirely in vain. It helped create conditions for the emergence of a new generation of Afghans who have a real and deep belief in democracy and who are working passionately to impact the future of their country. That commitment is reflected in the courage of young students who survived the terrorist attack at Kaj Educational Center in Kabul, which killed more than 60 students. Fatima Amiri, a 17-year-old teenager who was left severely wounded, losing one eye, went on to take her university exam less than two months after the attack. Even though passing with very high numbers, she expressed disappointment for not being among the top 10 nationwide. Meanwhile, one of her classmates, Mohammed Zia, who was also present during the attack, scored the fourth among all students nationwide. This, my friends, is reflective of our people's determination to face adversity and to find a way to overcome. But it also symbolizes the way in which Afghanistan's international friends, including Norway, helped impact a changed and, and an empowered society. So the question and challenge now before all of us is how to set Afghanistan back on the path of stability. Meanwhile, we know that the return of a normal situation will take time and require international support. Afghanistan Week here in Oslo demonstrates that Afghanistan remains a focus for Norway and other international friends. This week's discussions can help provide perspective on factors that led to what transpired, but more importantly, on what now needs to be done to achieve stability. Despite varying views on different aspects of the situation, there is one common understanding, that stability in Afghanistan is only possible, only possible through legitimate governance that's able to represent the people's aspirations. Meanwhile, History has proven that imposed rule in any part of the world is never sustainable nor acceptable to the people. This needs to be recognized by the Taliban. Thus, should the group desire acceptability as part of a broader national setup, they must respond to the people's demands. Respect for the rights of all Afghans, including especially women and minority groups, severing any and all ties with groups who threaten the stability of Afghanistan and the world at large, accepting a national political agreement for a unified and stable Afghanistan, and respecting, respecting whatever choice the people make regarding the future of their country. The absolute majority of the people of Afghanistan are still in very much in favor of a political agreement. And we believe that Norway and the international community still have a very important role to play in all areas including a political process that can lead to the formation of a broad-based and inclusive government that strengthens national unity. Moreover, we also hope to see a new consensus take shape in the UN Security Council on the way forward in Afghanistan. This will be imperative for any improvement in the situation towards stability. At the same time, the people of Afghanistan are very much able and ready to take charge and responsibility for their country's future. But they need to be supported by the international community. They look to the international community to continue to support their cause 
a cause which represents Afghanistan's interest, but also the interest of global stability. Let me conclude by once again thanking all friends here in Norway and elsewhere for making this event possible. I thank you. Thank you so much to Ambassador Yusuf Gafursai for his wise words, which then concludes this session. There is light snacks and refreshments served in the lobby outside. We hope that you will all stay along to continue the discussions. Obviously, we haven't been able to get to the depth of all issues, and neither did we expect so when we set out on a mission to host the Afghanistan Week for 2022. There are quite a few challenges, and those are challenges that we will eventually have to live with and engage with for the foreseeable future. We all realize that. But we hope that you can stay with us. We thank you uh, to the excellent panel for spending time with us. Thank you to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Anniken Wittfeldt, although she has already left. We were very glad to hear what she had to say this evening. And not the least, thank you for uh, your patience and your presence. Excellent audience. Very happy to have you all with us this evening. Please stay on and please do also check out the program because the uh, Afghanistan week is not over and that which has happened is already available in the stream. So there is much more to bite into. But for now, thank you so much. Thank you.